Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science Pub, where the top minds at Oregon State University share their passions in work and research with our community members in this digital environment. My name is Nathan Moses, the Assistant Director for Events and Engagement at OSU Cascades, and I thank you for attending this evening's event. Alex Michaels, who will be presenting tonight's event, Vitamin C and Health, Fact versus Fiction, will join us in a few minutes, but let's get to a few announcements and reminders first. So first up, um, Science on Tap is coming up in just a couple days as a reminder. So Wine and Travel make the perfect pairing for an evening together with Beaver Friends. Join Oregon State alumni as OSU Science on Tap returns with an interactive virtual discussion and wine tasting Thursday, April 15th at 5.30 p.m. Discover the sensory science of wine with OSU Fermentation Science Program's Elizabeth Tomasino, after learning about the characteristics of wine from Oregon and Italy, hear you how you can experience the region on Alumni Group Travel's upcoming tour, Flavors of Northern Italy, departing September of 2021. Find out more information at OSU Alumni Association. Science Pub reminder coming up. Our next four events, uh, both collaboratively and regionally, will be coming up. They're on screen right now. The next one, uh, registration's coming up. We'll see OSU Cascade's own Ryan Reese presenting on Eco Wellness on April 20th, followed by a conversation with Bryson Robertson about wave energy on May 10th. Rounding out the academic year, we'll have John Parmigiani with a dive into OSU's prototype development laboratory on May 25th, and Matt Orr bringing his research on gut ecosystems and relevance to human health on the evening of June 7th. All science pubs through 2021 will live right here on this YouTube channel starting at 6 p.m. And finally, uh, we do have an event that is coming up again, very short order. Um, Ibram Kendi uh, will be presenting here uh, for OSU, one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. Ibram X. Kennedy is, an, uh, Kendi is a professor, historian, renowned speaker, and one of the country's leading anti-racist scholars. He is a best-selling author of seven books, contributing writer at The Atlantic, and Humanities and Founding Director of the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Kendi is was a recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship and Boston University's Andrew W. Mellon Professorship in the Humanities. So come check that event out. Registration info is on that slide. All right, everybody, if you are new to Science Pub or your returning guest, uh, we utilize Mentimeter for all of our audience participation tonight. We will be taking a quiz here in just a few moments. You can take a screenshot of that QR code and take you directly to the Minty.com site, or you can just type in Minty.com on a second monitor or another device. Tonight's event code is going to be 56681696. Again, that's 56681696. You do not have to remember that because it's at the bottom of your screen tonight. Um, so make sure when you log in, put your G rated nickname in because those will be viewable to the audience and we'll go through questions one at a time you'll get about 15 seconds to answer each question and then we'll move on the faster you answer the more points you get so uh, take that into consideration tonight all the quiz questions are based on tonight's program so we'll see how good you are with your knowledge before our presentation about vitamin c so having said that we will get right to that um, for the quiz so we'll we'll get that all dialed in here and we'll go up for question one and everybody go ahead and get those submissions in there. Get your nickname in there. We'll get started with the trivia question in very short order. Got a couple, couple guests. Again, you can keep playing as we go. Get a couple more people in there and we will get started here in just a minute. Excellent. Now they're coming in. And if you don't want to participate tonight virtually, then you can just cheer on your folks uh, from your uh, living room sofa. All right, give people about 10 more seconds to get in there if you haven't logged in yet. What I will say as we're waiting, we're going to be using Mentimeter for the question answer part after Alex's presentation as well, if you're not familiar with that. So as soon as trivia is concluded for this evening, um, we will switch over and you will see a slide up there for ask Alex a question. So. Uh, we will do that, and that will be available once we get done with trivia tonight and during Alex's uh, presentation, if you have a, have a question. All right, so I think we will get started here. They're slowly coming. This is fun. It's kind of the trickle effect for tonight. Usually, it's, it's either one big lump motion or <laughs> looks like we have eight, nine guests. So let's get started with that, guys. So we'll go ahead and start now. First question coming up. Again, the quicker you answer, more points you get. So which of these has the most vitamin C? Oranges, strawberries, bell peppers, or kale? So 
Two seconds, one second. All right. Oranges, strawberries, and kale were all, but bell pepper is the correct. Alex, you stumped them, buddy. We'll, we'll talk about that clearly in your presentation, but bell peppers actually have the most vitamin C. All right. Question two. Get that loaded up. If you take too many vitamin C tablets, you might ooh, turn slightly orange. That'd be terrifying. Smell funny, lose your sense of taste, or go to the bathroom frequently. A lot, a lot for, uh, for D, and they were correct. Go to the bathroom frequently. Answer D. Nice job, you five. Question number three. Besides humans, what other animals can't synthesize vitamin C? This one stumped me, Alex. When you get on here, I did, you know, I like to think of myself as a little bit knowledgeable in science, but you got me on this one. Parrots, iguanas, guinea pigs, or rabbits? Guinea pigs, <laughs> nicely done. If you answered C for that response, guinea pigs, you got it correct. Add points to your profile. Question four to five, four, number four of five. Which of the following will help preserve vitamin C in food? Adding acid, frying, blending, exposing to light. Those of you at home, I got this one wrong too. I did some research. I was incorrect. Adding acid, frying, blending, exposing to light. We have some smarties. I said exposing to light. I failed that one. All right, question five. Who was awarded a Nobel Prize for their work with vitamin C? Linus Pauling, Albert St. Yorgi, James Lynn, because Casimir Funk. <laughs> Going blind as Polly, but it was actually Albert St. Yorgi. Good try, though. We tried to throw you off, you know, Linus Pauling Institute. Nice job, Alex. Well done. Good scores, but looks like I love kombuchas is our winner tonight. I also love kombucha. Give him a shout out on YouTube. I love kombuchas. Nicely done tonight. Well done. Well done. Well played. All right. Well, thanks for participating, everybody. Um, Mentimeter, those of you with your devices, you should see it scroll over to ask our presenter a question. You will use that for this evening. Uh, but uh, just want to say thanks again for playing the quiz. It's always a lot of fun for us. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce... Um, our presenter and bring him to stage tonight. So um, Alex has been working at the Linus Pauling Institute for over 20 years. He initially came to Oregon State University in Corvallis after graduating from the University of Illinois Urbana, Champaign, with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry. He was attracted to Linus Pauling Institute because of their cross-disciplinary approach. Investigators at the Institute cross many scientific fields, including biochemistry, nutrition, pharmacy, toxicology, and veterinary medicine. Alex began his work with vitamin C with Dr. Tony Hagen at the Institute. Dr. Hagen's work focuses on approaches to healthy aging. Under Dr. Hagen's guidance, Alex started looking at the reasons behind the age-related changes in vitamin C status. This ultimately brought his focus to understanding some of the genetic regulation of vitamin C transport proteins, the proteins that are responsible for vitamin C absorption, vitamin C excretion, and the accumulation of vitamin C and tissues. After graduating with his PhD, also in biochemistry in 2007, he worked with Dr. Baltz Fry, then director of the Linus Paul Institute. With Dr. Fry, Alex continued to work with vitamin C transport and understanding absorption, but also started to, to delve into human clinical trials with, with lipoic acid. Additionally, he started to work with the outreach programs at the Institute, bringing scientific information about many vitamins and minerals, including vitamin C, to a wider audience, kind of like tonight. Currently, Alex serves as both a clinical research coordinator and a communications officer for the Linus Pauling Institute. 
He has published several research articles and books and book chapters on vitamin C geared for a scientific audience, but also authored publications and produced media related to vitamin C research for public consumption. And I guess without further ado, uh, first, Alex, thanks so much for your time tonight. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the event this evening. So I'll let you Thank take you. it away. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I am going to first figure out how to start my presentation. <laughs> Um, but thanks for that intro. Uh, it's a it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I I'm really surprised that uh, some of the people didn't get bell pepper. I was expecting somebody to get it uh, during that uh, that beginning. But um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And we can get started with the presentation. Okay. So as Nathan mentioned, my name is Alexander Michaels. I am uh, both a researcher and a communications officer at the Lance Paul Institute. So I do a little bit of science and a little bit of talking uh, from now, from time to time. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about vitamin C. And for the most part, I'm just gonna be talking about the basics of vitamin C and touching a little bit on vitamin C and health. Um, because, you know, honestly, we see a lot of misinformation in on that topic. I mean, you, you hear things in the media or you'll hear someone say something on YouTube, for instance, that's not entirely true. Um, well, I'll try to call out vitamin C rumors as we go along. Uh, if you think of any while, while I'm speaking, go ahead and just ask me questions about them. I've probably heard them all, but every once in a while I get a, a one out of left field. So I really like to, you know, if you know one, put it out there. Uh, so I'm going to start today with a little bit of history. And the story of vitamin C actually starts with scurvy. Um, so scurvy is a disease that appeared uh, off and on throughout the last few millennia. Um, but it really didn't become prevalent until the age of discovery, you know, so when we we're starting to sail uh, long distances without having uh, access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, and the longer and longer we sailed, we found out that people were getting sicker and sicker. And this was just a terrible disease that caused um, strange corkscrew hair growth, bleeding uh, gums, um, loss of teeth. Uh, you know, they, they have these subdermal bleeding uh, issues you can kind of see in the diagram here. Um, and, and this was a progressive disease. So at the beginning, when people started getting it, they were just feeling tired. They felt a little moody. Um, but as it got worse, the symptoms got worse. And towards the end, um, I mean, I've heard reports of people just begging for death because they just felt awful and they were kind of just falling apart at the end. Um, and, and usually sailors who, who got scurvy would die of infection. Um, the scurvy got so bad at some point that in some naval voyages, they were just assuming they were going to lose 50% of their sailors during the voyage due, due to scurvy. Now, you know, as time went on, they tried to find cures for scurvy. And there were all these kind of home remedies for scurvy popping up all over the place. But, you know, as, as, as soon as a new remedy would come along, another one would replace it. And people just kept forgetting which things worked and which things didn't. It wasn't really passed on very well. And that, that brings us to um, kind of all the way to the 17th century at this point, because um, many sailors were still dying on ships up until that point. And um, there was a great debate on what was actually causing scurvy. So a physician named James Lind, who's pictured here, um, was is given credit for discovering the cure to scurvy. And I'm going to be frank and say that James Lind probably wasn't the one who figured out the cure. It was a group effort. There was some people before him and people that came after him that were trying new things, including citrus uh, specifically, to see if that could cure scurvy. Um, Lind wasn't the first physician to use scurvy. He also wasn't the first to show that certain foods could cure scurvy, but he was accredited uh, for doing kind of a uh, a randomized trial where he split some sailors into different groups and compared different scurvy remedies to each other at the same instance. Um, sometimes these cures worked, sometimes they didn't. Even Lind found that, uh, you know, on subsequent voyages, he did one in um, where, you know, he saw the remarkable effects of, of lemon juice, 
But then he did another one and it didn't work. And it turned out that boiling the lemon juice deactivated some property of it. But they couldn't figure that out back then because um, they really didn't know what was in food that could cause these effects. Um, but fresh fruits and vegetables and this fresh citrus, of course, was was important to surviving the long voyages. British sailors eventually became known as limeys because of the lime juice they carried around with them uh, to prevent scurvy. So there was a whole host of these, these anti-scorbutic, and that's the, the term they give to things that can cure scurvy, anti-scorbutic um, plants. But they really, even at this point, didn't understand what was in those plants that was actually causing or, or ca giving the cure, you know, relieving the symptoms. It took a few hundred years, actually, after that. Um, well, maybe about 150. So at about the turn of the 20th century, um, there was a new revolution in nutrition uh, where there was something, they, they realized, scientists realized that there was something besides fat, carbohydrates, and protein in food, that there was something else in there that they hadn't discovered before. Uh, and this was going to be eventually known as the vitamin. In 1912, uh, a Polish biochemist by the name of Kazimir Funk, if you remember his name from the, uh, the trivia questions, w launched a hunt for vitamins. And soon, you know, every, the hunt was on. Everyone was trying to find these, these vitamins that cured deficiency diseases. And scurvy turned out to be a deficiency disease um, for vitamin C. Um, Albert St. Jorgi was a Hungarian chemist who was investigating the biological oxidation reactions in, in plants. And uh, he found that if he squeezed uh, some drops of juice from certain plants onto these chemical reactions that were occurring, he could actually inhibit them. And he, this is kind of, um, now we think of this as being an antioxidant something that inhibits oxidation is an antioxidant. But then he just called it a potent inhibitor of biological oxidation. He wanted to figure out what it was. And so he, he used his chemistry skills and tried to isolate it from various plants and, and um, vegetables, fruit. He had trouble with, um, with citrus, actually. He tried citrus and couldn't isolate it because there were so many other compounds in citrus that interfered that were so similar to the compound that he was looking for. What he actually found out, wound up doing was going to peppers, and he used uh, Hungarian peppers, which was a very potent, abundant source of, of the molecule that he was looking for. So he's able to isolate it. He named it hexaronic acid, which is a really uh, bland name for what the compound was, and then um, you know published his paper. He actually uh, uh, won his Nobel Prize for his work with biological oxidation reactions and the discovery of vitamin C. Um, and it was shortly after he discovered hexaronic acid um, and, and, and figured out its chemical structure, they started to postulate that maybe vitamin C was actually this anti-scorbutic factor that they've been looking for. And all vitamins um, have a deficiency disease associated with them. Or um, So uh, vitamin A uh, cures night blindness. Vitamin B1, which is thiamine, cures beriberi. Vitamin C cured scurvy. And vitamin C is just named vitamin C because it's the third vitamin that was discovered. Uh, I know there's a whole host of B, um, B vitamins out there, but if I went into how vitamins were named, we'd be here for another hour. Um, but uh, vitamin C got renamed ascorbic acid because of its property of curing scurvy, ascorbic acid, uh, because it's also an acid. Um, there's a pervasive myth out there. Uh, most people probably haven't heard it, but I've heard it a lot, that a lot of people think vitamin C is not just ascorbic acid, that there's some um, complex of factors out there that make up vitamin C, and that turns out to be not the truth. Uh, vitamin C is ascorbic acid because if you give ascorbic acid to some animal that has scurvy or a person that has scurvy, it cures the scurvy. It's the definition of the, of the vitamin. But vitamin C is only a vitamin for certain animal species. Uh, many mammals can synthesize the vitamin. So if you, you remember the trivia question at the beginning, um, 
parrots, uh, bir- a lot of birds can synthesize it. A lot of fish can synthesize it. All lizards, um, most mammals except for the guinea pig, fruit bats, and uh, higher order primates. Interestingly enough, primates lost the ability to to synthesize vitamin C, and humans also do not have that ability. So it is a vitamin for us. We need to get it from our diet. So after um, St. Yorgi uh, isolated vitamin C, uh, he uh, it was actually um, commercialized. The isolation process was uh, developed and refined, and it became the first vitamin in 1934 to be produced as a supplement. Um, vitamin C is usually found as a crystalline white powder, kind of fine powder. It doesn't get as um, chunky crystals as, uh, say, table sugar. It's it's kind of fine, um, white, uh, and acidic. Um, people often are worried about synthesized vitamin C, and they say, oh, I can't have synthesized vitamin C. It has to be natural. And it just turns out that there's really no chemical difference between synthesized vitamin C and natural vitamin C. Um, and people are worried about the sources that are used to make vitamin C. Most vitamin C that we get nowadays is made from sugar, uh, but you know, some sort of sugar source, maybe corn. Um, honestly, once it gets converted to vitamin C, none of the original material is there. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, the first commercialized supplement was done by a Hoffman, Hoffman LaRoche company who made their Redoxon formula. You can see here uh, on the, the right. Okay. So um, let me first start by telling you some properties of ascorbic acid. Um, ascorbic acid, if you, if you remember any of your organic chemistry, uh, is a carbohydrate. Um, all you can see, you can see carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen here. It looks a lot like sugar. And like I said, it's made from sugar. It actually looks like a molecule of glucose with a, a, a ring structure in it. This ring is very important because it actually allows the vitamin C molecule to donate electrons and accept electrons, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, it degrades in sunlight, uh, and UV light will, will start to make it break down. So, um, you know, there was a, there was a question about, you know, how to preserve vitamin C in the trivia. And most people don't sit there around and expose their food to sunlight, except in a grocery store. Um, and there was a study that was done once done about the vitamin C in orange juice. Turns out light shining on your clear uh, orange juice bottles will actually start to degrade over time that that vitamin C. It's also pretty susceptible to heat. So if you want to preserve vitamin C, uh, try to keep it cold as much as possible. Uh, it reacts with oxygen. So blending is a bad idea for vitamin C. You just don't want to incorporate any air into anything that has vitamin C to, if you want to keep it stable. And it is much more stable in acid than in basic conditions. It doesn't like neutral um, and basic. It really likes to stay in acid as much as possible. So, you know, a couple tips for keeping your vitamin C stable in food, heat it as little as possible, keep it in acid, keep it away from oxygen, and also avoid iron and copper. If you're going to cook with anything containing vitamin C, it can react with iron and copper. Now, um, most pans nowadays are coated. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to worry about those reactions, but you know, on some of the older iron or, or cast iron, sometimes um, you can actually get a loss of vitamin C. So um, sources of vitamin C aren't too surprising. Fresh fruits and vegetables are the primary sources. Um, they vary considerably uh, the amount of vitamin C per uh, you know different fr- fruits tend to have more than vegetables. Um, citrus, you know, is is pretty good source, but for, for its size, kiwi is actually a, a better source of vitamin C. But the, the king of, of vitamin C is actually peppers, um, bell peppers, uh, especially I think it's orange bell peppers is one of the highest sources of vitamin C uh, that exists. You eat a whole bell pepper and you're getting multiple fold uh, your daily requirements. But, you know, brassicas uh, also contain vitamin C. Um, uh, berries are another great source of vitamin C as well. And then of course there's vitamin C supplements. You know, everybody asks about vitamin C supplements and um, it, it comes, vitamin C comes in a lot of different varieties. It's very cheaply made actually. So they usually have to add something in there or change it somehow. 
to, to, so you can get some value and sell you a more expensive supplement. But really there's very little difference between these formulations. And I'll go into that a little bit later on in this talk. So what does vitamin C do? Um, getting into the health you know, question of, of vitamin C. Um, it's an amazing molecule. Like most vitamins, it can do multiple things in the body. In relation to scurvy, the, the most prominent feature of vitamin C is that it, it regulates or finishes one of the final steps of collagen synthesis. So it's not, it, it, there may be some regulation that vitamin C does of how collagen is produced, but what it really does is uh, stabilizes uh, in collagen connections and makes a tighter a weave, I guess you could say, a, a strong molecule. When you're low on vitamin C, your collagen fibers will start to break apart. They'll break easily. And so um, they're less cross-linked is what we say. Uh, and so that's when you get wounds reopening and bleeding, you know, uh, blood vessels opening back up again. Um, another thing that vitamin C is useful for is the production of carnitine. Now, um, there is some debate on whether how much vitamin C goes into the synthesis of carnitine, but carnitine is a molecule that is used to transport fats in, from your cytosol in cells into the mitochondria, and that's how you burn fatty acids. Uh, but if you have low carnitine, you're going to kind of feel that low energy because you're not really burning fat very well. And then it's also involved in uh, catecholamine production, particularly uh, norepinephrine, which is a precursor to epinephrine, adrenaline. Um, when people have uh, low vitamin C levels, they tend to feel, um, well, I mean, depressed, I guess you could say is the easiest way to put it. Um, but vitamin C is also involved in a lot of other things. And we'll talk a little bit about antioxidant protection. It's one of the, you know, the, the, um, the best antioxidants found in the bloodstream, uh, water soluble at least, uh, but it's also involved in you know things like tyrosine. Iron homeostasis is a big, uh, I think it's a big future topic for vitamin C. We know that vitamin C is involved in things like iron absorption when you take iron and vitamin C together, but I think vitamin C actually has a lot, a big role to play in how iron moves through the body. Um, and then as we'll talk a little bit later, vitamin C is also big in the immune system. And if you don't have enough vitamin C, your immune system is going to be impaired like a lot of vitamins and minerals. And then there's some emerging roles for vitamin C in DNA methylation and the response to hypoxia. So ascorbic acid is a molecule that is uh, an electron donor. Um, it can donate a single electron to another molecule in a process called oxidation. So any molecule that loses an electron is oxidized. Any molecule that accepts an electron becomes reduced. Now, the interesting feature about uh, vitamin C or ascorbic acid is that when it loses that electron, usually it, it forms a radical. Now, that's, that's not the unusual part because any um, molecule that, stable molecule that loses an electron will, will can form an unpaired um, electron is a radical. And usually these radicals are very reactive, but the radical for vitamin C, the ascorbyl radical, is actually pretty stable. It doesn't really react with anything but itself, another ascorbyl radical molecule. So this makes it an excellent sacrificial antioxidant. If a, another oxidant comes along, it can donate an electron to that oxidant, reducing it, making it safe or less toxic. And the byproduct, which is the ascorbyl radical, is relatively safe for the body anyway. And the body also has mechanisms to reduce the ascorbyl radical back to uh, the fully functional ascorbic acid. Um, and so, so I, when people tell me, oh, vitamin C is always an antioxidant, I said, no, it's not always an antioxidant. Sometimes it acts as an antioxidant, but in some of the reactions that we see on the next page here, it's actually acting as an electron donor. It's just throwing in electrons. When it's acting as an antioxidant, it's throwing in electrons as well. But there's some other functions of vitamin C that we'll talk about later when we get to intravenous vitamin C, where vitamin C switches from being an antioxidant to something that's a little bit like a pro-oxidant. So um, more on that in, in just a moment. Okay, so um, one of the common questions that I get is how much vitamin C should I be taking? Uh, 
And I wish I could just tell you um, a, a great number. Uh, I can tell you what the, the Linus Pauling recommends. I can tell you, Linus Pauling Institute recommends. I can tell you what Linus Pauling himself recommended. I can tell you what the uh, Institutes of Health recommend. But honestly, the answer is, is a little bit more nuanced than that. It's kind of like, what's your goal? Is your goal just to avoid deficiency? Uh, do you want to just reach the RDA? Or are you looking for something and it's a little bit more elusive, which is optimum health? So in order to answer that question for you a little bit, I, I still have to, I have to put my uh, vitamin C transport hat on. Uh, I, we wrote a review back in 2013, and I love this graphic because it kind of shows how complicated vitamin C levels in the body can be because there's transport throughout the body. Uh, there's things going in and out all the time. Diet is obviously your source of vitamin C, and that can, uh, is limited by absorption. So your body can't absorb all the vitamin C that you eat necessarily. Uh, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But then we've got, you know, circulation, transporting vitamin C to the tissues, the tissues retransporting back vitamin C back to the, um, to the blood. And then we've got utilization of vitamin C. So sometimes vitamin C gets used up in either enzyme reactions or antioxidant reactions. Uh, and then of course you get vitamin C being transported to the urine. It's the main route of vitamin C being eliminated from the body, but we also have something called renal reabsorption. So it can save some of that vitamin C from being lost in the urine. Um, so, but typically scientists look at blood levels of vitamin C, because that's kind of our indicator of what's really going on in the body. It'd be perfect if we could look at vitamin C in tissue, but most people aren't too keen about us ripping out tissue in a clinical study. Go figure. Okay, so when you eat vitamin C, um, the place where it gets absorbed is your small intestine. And in these uh, villi, which I've kind of uh, on the right hand side of the screen here, you can see these little, uh, the brush border membrane, uh, and all these little cells have little transport proteins on them. As vitamin C comes along, it can be sucked up by those transport proteins. The problem is the transport proteins can get overwhelmed. And so if you eat a small amount of vitamin C, that's okay. But larger and larger doses, uh, some of it gets left behind. So we talk about this in, in a concept of bioavailability. I don't know if you've ever heard of bioavailability, but the short version of it is how much of it of what you eat or what you take gets into your body uh, versus what passes through. Um, for vitamin C, doses of about 200 milligrams of vitamin C, 100, 200 milligrams are 100% bioavailable. When we go up to about 500 milligrams of vitamin C, we get down to about 75% bioavailability, which is pretty good. But doses above 1,000 milligrams can be um, can be as little as 50% bioavailable. And that what that means is that the amount that's left behind starts playing havoc with your gastrointestinal system. Now, for some people, um, it doesn't seem to affect them so much, but other people get horrible gas, diarrhea, um, bloating feeling, you know, just not, just not pleasant, uh, when you're taking too much vitamin C. Um, okay. <clears throat> so uh, the next few slides, I'm going to be talking about, uh, vitamin C in your blood versus the amount of vitamin C that you eat vitamins. So there's, um, the, these are data are gathered from, Mark Levine's work at the National Institutes of Health. He did a study on young, uh, healthy men and women and fed them certain regimented doses of vitamin C and watched their blood vitamin C levels change over time. Um, and if you notice, I'm going to point this out now, I'll bring it up again later, but the blood vitamin C levels that are measured here are in the micromolar range. And typically in, in most people, you get vitamin C uh, in the micromolar range, not in or yeah, micromolar range, not millimolar. Um, even people who are severely deficient, I mean, you have to be pretty darn low to have vitamin C levels that go below the micromolar range. And you're probably near death at that point anyway. So um, 
at the lowest intake levels, you're near scurvy. Um, and so when you start consuming vitamin C at this point, your blood levels don't really change very much. This is kind of a, a first plateau uh, where all the vitamin C that you're, cons be, you're consuming is being shuttled to your tissues. And in particular, it's going to be the tissues that want the vitamin C the most, which are those, the brain and the adrenal glands, and to some degree, the eye. Um, those tissues accumulate vitamin C first before any other tissues of your body. And it's just because your brain um, has the blood brain barrier there and there's transporters that will suck up that vitamin C, put it into the cerebral spinal fluid, and then you maintain uh, a reservoir of vitamin C in your cerebral spinal fluid that feeds the brain. The brain needs it. If it doesn't get enough vitamin C, the blood vessels that are in the brain will start to deteriorate. And we know this from animal models that if you, you know, severely deplete uh, vitamin C or, or use a genetic variant in the vitamin C transporters that prevent the vitamin C from getting in the brain, that um, you just the blood vessels will burst, um, you'll have a stroke and die. Um, but so at this point, you know, up to say 25 milligrams of vitamin C a day, you're still trying to get the, the brain saturated. And so we use that term saturated a lot because we're talking about kind of the, your capacity to absorb vitamin C. When the brain is saturated, that means it just can't absorb anymore or, or it's getting close to that point. We also talk about saturation when we're talking about plasma and I'll, I'll explain that more in just a moment. Um, so, you know, at this point, vitamin C levels start going up in the blood uh, because the brain is full. It's now allowing more vitamin C to distribute throughout the body. Other tissues start taking vitamin C and uh, the, the blood levels go up slowly, kind of a linear, almost linear uh, response between how much you take and what's in your blood. Um, and, and you can kind of see at the top end of the curve, it's starting to cur you know, plateau over just a little bit. Now I'll show you that in a different graph in just a moment, um, but we're reaching kind of an inflection point here. And this is where they decided that the RDAs should be because it kind of uh, gives you enough vitamin C to get over this steep part of the curve, although you're not quite on the other end of it, um, you're still, way above that deficiency zone. So RDAs are set to give you um, protection from deficiency uh, for a certain amount of time, um, you know, of, of stopping intake. <clears throat> so as we consume more and more vitamin C, each of the tissues of our body start to accumulate, like I said, uh, based on the data from young adults, we know that blood levels uh, start to kind of saturate or, or plateau around 200 milligrams. Um, at this point, many of your tissues have at least, some of them are, are saturated, some other organs such as your um, lungs, I believe, and um, skeletal muscle is kind of one of the last ones to saturate. It, it actually has low levels of vitamin C, but the heart will start to saturate. Um, at the, and, and the kidney, uh, sensing that the vitamin C levels are getting a little high, will start to filter that extra vitamin C out. So the more and more you take at this point, not only do you have the problem of um, lower bioavailability, but you've got the kidneys actively working against you to kick that vitamin C into the urine. Um, so when we're talking about vitamin C and health, uh, we, we kind of look at this as three different areas of the curve. Um, at the beginning is kind of the enzyme functions where your body's just trying to get over deficiency state, make sure those enzymes get enough vitamin C in the tissues so they can run properly and we can avoid deficiency. Um, then you get antioxidant functions on top of that. So the more and more vitamin C you have in your blood, the more and more vitamin C you have in your tissues, the more protected you are against uh, oxidants, uh, free radicals. Um, but then there's this idea that, that at the top end, at higher and higher levels of intake, there may be other functions of vitamin C going on. This is kind of our nebulous area. We don't really know uh, what those other functions might be. I could speculate, but um, this is just kind of the, you know, 
antioxidant functions continue on, you know, even as the more and more you take, but your blood levels and your tissue levels don't get any higher. So maybe there's something else going on. We don't really know. Uh, another way of looking at this is what we call vitamin C status. Um, so at the lowest levels, like I said before, you know, you're at deficiency. You go a little bit higher than that, and um, you're kind of at this inadequate range. So you're above deficiency. You're not going to have any signs of deficiency, but you don't have enough vitamin C to mount an adequate antioxidant defense. And it, um, you're doing a little bit better, but um, studies that have been done on vitamin C intake, mainly, mainly dietary studies, suggest that you're at higher risk for certain diseases when your vitamin C levels are this are low. Um, but then you go further and you get up to the saturation point or near saturation point, and you're kind of reaching this optimum vitamin C status. Uh, we, we kind of say that everybody should really have vitamin C levels above 50 micromolar to be considered you know, fully protected. And usually when you're looking at studies of people who have high vitamin C status versus low vitamin C status, you see a reduced risk of, of various diseases, cardiovascular disease um, being one of them. <clears throat> so what's the best way to reach optimum or where, you know, where do you want to be in this optimum? I think we have a lot of uh, debate around this in the vitamin C community right now. Um, the RDA is obviously meant to address deficiency and give you a little buffer above deficiency to keep, you know, um, to keep you protected for longer in case your vitamin C intake stops. But optimum is kind of a different question. It's kind of, you know, where do we see the most benefit without harm? Um, most, a lot of research has suggested 200 milligrams per day is sufficient, at least uh, for healthy people, 200 milligrams per day is sufficient, but uh, and that's just because um, the, the the plasma is saturated, the curve is starting to turn over. Uh, if you look at tissues, they all start to saturate at this point as well. Uh, actually, they're, some of them are uh, like white blood, white blood cells are completely saturated at this point. But the Lyons Pauling Institute actually suggests that people try to get 400 milligrams per day. Uh, and this is because this curve was generated in young, healthy adults, uh, kind of college age adults. We don't know what this curve looks like for older adults, um, for people on uh, different diets. You know, they were, these people were, the, the test subjects in this study were, were given a very controlled diet, let's put it that way. Uh, we don't know what this does in presence of disease or other underlying conditions, or we don't know what this curve looks like for smokers. We do know that smokers have a higher oxidative stress burden and they need more uh, vitamin C, but we don't know if that changes this relationship as you go up in doses. So <clears throat> at this point, I've only kind of brushed on vitamin C and health. I'd like to get a little bit more specific at this point. Um, vitamin C and health is kind of a big a big topic. We could spend, you know, days talking about the nuances of vitamin C and health. Um, and uh, even though we've been doing research on vitamin C for for nearly a century now, um, we don't know nearly about um, enough about it as we would like to know. One of the reasons is you can't just test vitamin C like a drug. You have it's a it's a part of your diet. You have to have uh, some vitamin C. So you have to have some amount of vitamin C in one group versus some other amount of vitamin C in another group. So there's kind of a couple of approaches we can take to that. One is looking at vitamin C levels in your diet. And, um, and so a vitamin C rich diet versus a vitamin C poor diet, there's some trends that show up. You know, we've got vitamin, um, vitamin C is being associated with healthy blood vessels, healthy brain function, healthy immune system, healthy heart, healthy eyes. But the problem is, does that translate over to taking vitamin C supplements? Um, you know, if vitamin C rich diets are causing healthy blood vessels, does that mean taking vitamin C supplements will reduce your blood pressure? Maybe. Um, does there's some evidence to suggest that it could reduce blood pressure? Uh, it does help with vascular tone. Uh, it does seem to, you know, in some people reduce blood pressure by a few points. Um, but if it's associated with healthy brain function, does that mean it reduces the risk for Alzheimer's disease? 
No, there's very little evidence for that. Um, does it help fight off viruses? Yeah, perhaps. Um, but you can see that you know the evidence for supplements and the evidence for diet are kind of two different uh, parts of the equation here. Um, we need to do a lot more work on vitamin C supplements to understand them completely. But um, and, and there's a lot more to a vitamin C rich diet uh, than just vitamin C. Obviously, you got a lot, if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, you're getting a lot of other things in there that could be helping your health. So, um, I mean, if you want the details on every topic of vitamins or most topics, vitamin C and health, I suggest that you go to the Linus Pauling Institute's Micronutrient Information Center, which is kind of what I like to call the Wikipedia of vitamins. Uh, you can find uh, a summary of all uh, research studies, uh, particularly in humans. I mean, it's a focus on human subjects uh, that exists. Um, and, and it's not just limited to vitamins. There's vitamins, minerals, other substances and foods like flavonoids that you can you can look up as well. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm going to pick some select topics for the rest of the talk. Uh, but if you want to go deeper or if you want to you know, see some other topics I barely touched on, I'd say go to the Micronutrient Information Center. So I'll start by introducing this guy. This guy is Linus Pauling. Um, Dr. Linus Pauling, a uh, famous OSU alumnus, he uh, went to Oregon State University when it was still called Oregon Agricultural College. Um, he spent his early career working in chemistry, uh, working on the nature of chemical bond, um, and he actually got his first Nobel Prize in uh, for the, his discoveries in the nature of the chemical bond. He did not get any Nobel Prizes for his work with vitamin C, on, on the other hand. His second Nobel Prize was actually for his peace advocacy work. He was against um, nuclear proliferation, the testing of nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons. And so he worked um, kind of in the middle of his career, I mean, throughout his career, but very actively in the 60s uh, against uh, nuclear warfare. Um, but at the age where most people would be thinking about retirement in his late 60s, uh, vitamin, uh, vitamin C kind of jumped in front of Linus Pauling and he grabbed onto it. Uh, so he started uh, researching this and uh, just kind of took off into a no, uh, New York Times bestselling book, uh, Vitamin C and the Common Cold. Um, you may only know vitamin C because of this book. Well, not this book, but the one that came before. This is the second edition, Lias Pauling's uh, edition. We put flu into the, um, the title. Uh, but basically, he was doing some research and looked at all of the vitamin C research that existed at the time and saw that there was evidence out there that large amounts of vitamin C could actually do something for the immune system. Now, at this point, I'll tell you, the research on vitamin C uh, that existed before this book was published was pretty poor. Um, but... Uh, Linus Pauling did spur a lot of vitamin C research after this book was published and, and the search for, hey, does, could vitamin C really be doing something for immunity? Now, at the time this book was published, the, vitamin, the RDA for vitamin C was much less than it is today. Um, people were only recommended to get um, 30 to 45 milligrams of vitamin C in the 70s, uh, 60s and 70s. And... Um, and so I think for some people, vitamin C was having a huge effect because they had just been so without it their entire life. Um, so during, also in the vitamin C book, I should mention that Linus Pauling did recommend that people get optimum doses of vitamin C, a concept he called orthomolecular nutrition. It's you get the right dose of a, a molecule to best suit your health. He admitted, though, he didn't really know what that level was. And so with a guess, he kind of said 250 to 10,000 milligrams of vitamin C based on his evidence. And of course, this uh, spurred um, later on, but you know, this is more a uh, recent example, but uh, over the decades, vitamin C supplement companies going crazy, uh, creating a lot of different vitamin C supplements at a lot of different levels to help boost your immune system. Um, kind of a little trivia uh, portion here. Emergency was actually developed by a um, 
Jay Patrick, who is a friend of Lions Pauling, um, and his the original company's um, headquarters was founded on Pauling Drive in Irvine, California. Um, but you know there is some truth to to everything we hear about vitamin C and and uh, the immune system. Um, in a sense, Pauling was right. If you're low in vitamin C, your immune system is in trouble. Even taking a small amount of vitamin C at that point will be beneficial. Now, while Pauling's suggestion that vitamin C at high doses could perform or form a shield against viruses was a little out there. Um, some people have seen some miraculous effects with taking high doses of vitamin C supplements. Um, the science kind of says that routine supplementation with vitamin C reduces the incidence of common cold in people who are undergoing um, uh, heavy physical stress. Uh, you know, I think the data is on um, marathon runners and skiers uh, under extreme conditions. Uh, but then there is also data that says that taking vitamin C in advance of a cold actually can reduce the duration of that cold. So it doesn't necessarily prevent colds in the general population, but it can if you're taking it regularly, you could um, you could see some benefits. Uh, you could you could see a, a shorter cold uh, as it comes along. Some people even say that you know in their hands, if they take vitamin C regularly during a cold, that cold is much shorter and much less severe. Um, the Lions Pauling Institute just published uh, a. Uh, the results of a clinical trial uh, using a multivitamin uh, that contained large amounts of vitamin C, but some other uh, vitamins and minerals as well. And they saw lower uh, symptoms in the multivitamin group and um, lower, lower intensity symptoms and uh, fewer symptoms in that group. So um, the question on everyone's mind in the last year has been, so what does vitamin C do for COVID-19? Um, I like to call this <laughs> this photo the Pauling effect. Uh, vitamin C got sold out in many grocery stores. This is my local Bymart um, uh, early in the pandemic. And I think the, the easiest thing for me to say is, yes, vitamin C supports a healthy immune system. We really have very limited data about vitamin C in COVID-19. But um, it, there, it kind of goes along the same vein as the evidence with the common cold. It won't be a perfect shield, but it could help uh, your immune system in, in times of crisis. Um, if anyone's been paying attention to the news about two, two months ago today, actually, uh, the Cleveland Clinic released a, uh, the results of a clinical trial on zinc and vitamin C. They called it not effective. Um, I found this trial a little disappointing, of course, being a vitamin C person. Um, but what they did was they they got COVID-19 patients and loaded them up. They put them in one of four treatment groups, one with zinc, uh, one with zinc and vitamin C, one with vitamin C alone, and one with uh, standard care. All patients got standard care. And um, if you look at the data from this study, um, I could see where they were getting at. There wasn't any distinct differences between the curves on any of the treatment groups, but they terminated this study early because they said it was futile to continue. And unfortunately, that meant that they halved the study population. They have the statistical power and they kind of I mean, in some senses, shot themselves in the foot because a later analysis by um, one of uh, prominent vitamin C researchers showed that the differences between the vitamin C group and the usual care group graphed here on the right suggests that there could have been something there if they just continued on. So it doesn't say anything. It's, it does say that, that vitamin C is not a miracle cure for COVID, but saying that it does nothing is a little bit premature. So according to the scientific evidence, you know, can vitamin C supplements stop you from getting a virus? No. Uh, I, tell, I tell people all the time, no amount of vitamin C is going to stop anyone from sneezing in your face. Um, but it can help you once you've contracted that virus, hopefully. Uh, can vitamin C be beneficial in an immune system? Yes. I mean, we already know that vitamin C deficiency uh, results in a weakened immune system. Um, more vitamin C, or especially vitamin C in advance of getting a virus is, is a good thing. And, um, you know, just don't go crazy with it. Um, 
and like, you know, can vitamin C help you once you've contracted the virus? Perhaps, you know, it may be more important in severe infections than the mild infections, but there's still research studies going on. In fact, I see the clinical trials on uh, clinicaltrials.gov all the time and notice that there's still uh, more and more trials ongoing and more and more popping up all the time. And that actually has me transition into a different topic, which is intravenous vitamin C. But I'll start with talking about vitamin C and cancer because vitamin C and cancer was the second book that Linus Pauling wrote. Um, he teamed up with a Scottish uh, surgeon named Ewan Cameron. And in their trials, they were giving vitamin C to see if that could in, uh, act as a vitamin C or a cancer treatment. Uh, they saw some amazing effects on quality of life and, um, and delayed progression of cancer during those treatments. Um, but without going into too many details, I'll just like to say that, you know, these, these effects haven't really been seen with vitamin C supplements going forward. There's some issues and there's some nuances to vitamin C cancer trials. Um, so it wasn't a miraculous, um, thing taking vitamin C supplements, but what they also did during, uh, Pauling studies is they used intravenous vitamin C, uh, vitamin C directly infused into the bloodstream. And this turned out to be important because this was kind of the little nugget of information that was kind of buried in the book a little bit, but it may have been uh, important for the effect, some of the effects that they've seen. And this is because intravenous vitamin C bypasses the small intestine. That's your gatekeeper. Uh, keeping vitamin C out, like I said before, that only a certain amount could be absorbed. If you go directly intravenous infusion, you can get millimolar levels of vitamin C. If you remember before I said micromolar is typical, and if you see in this graph on the red, that's kind of the micromolar range right there. The millimolar range is about a thousand times higher than that, and you can get these large waves of vitamin C going through the body. And you think, oh, that can't be good for you, but turns out it's, I, I wouldn't say harmless, but in most people, it's generally safe. Uh, you do have to do some screening before you do an intravenous infusion, just to make sure that there's not some factors that can make that vitamin C work uh, in, in negative ways. But um, yeah, uh, I've seen results of people getting 50 to 100 grams. You know, no, normally when we're talking about supplements, we're talking about milligrams grams of vitamin C and have no uh, deleterious effects. So these high levels of vitamin C are important because it changes some of the chemistry of vitamin C at that point. At, it, instead of being an antioxidant, like I mentioned before, vitamin C is now donating its electrons to things that weren't necessarily accepting electrons before, like oxygen. Now, it, this can happen in one of two different ways. It can either have a metal uh, involved in the reaction or no metal involved in the reaction, depending on which pathway you want to take. And that's kind of just semantics with the, the biochemistry. But what happens is it forms superoxide, which is an oxidant. Superoxide is, is normally produced by the body. Um, and but, but when you have this wave of vitamin C coming over, through, you can get more superoxide being produced and that superoxide gets transformed into hydrogen peroxide. That hydrogen peroxide then can flood into a cancer cell. And there's certain cancer cells where that hydrogen peroxide is going to cause damage. Normal cells, your, your normal body cells can handle a little hydrogen peroxide, but some cancer cells, and I won't say this is happening in all cancer cells, because that would be an oversimplification of the process. But in some cells, hydrogen peroxide is deadly. Um, and I'm going to gloss over a whole lot of cancer research here that was done in animals and cells, and just kind of say that this does seem to work in some people. Now, vitamin C is usually not given alone. It's usually given with standard care. But in for example, this uh, study shown here in glioblastoma patients, um, extended median survival in patients. Um, and as you can see on the right, that vitamin C administration seems to reduce tumor size in some, not all. Um, and it's not, you know, overwhelming response. The tumor's not gone. There's not necessarily aggression. Although I have heard some studies, you know, where, or some, uh, 
some people who have gotten uh, vitamin C and seen complete tumor regression. Um, I, I'm going to just preface this with it just depends on the cancer and it depends on the therapies that you're getting some vitamin C uh, some are not vitamin C sensitive at all. And we really don't know exactly how this works. I would say it's hydrogen peroxide, but there's actually some evidence that other molecules and other mechanisms are occurring simultaneously with this wave of hydrogen peroxide. So it's kind of um, stay tuned. Hopefully soon we'll know more about vitamin C and uh, cancer treatment and how to make it better. Um, another way that vitamin C or intravenous vitamin C is, is making some waves is uh, treatments for sepsis. Um, Dr. Paul Merrick and uh, Dr. Uh, Barry Fowler in, in Virginia uh, found a vitamin C cocktail with, um, with some other uh, compounds seemed to be helpful in the treatment of sepsis. Now, uh, we don't exactly know how much vitamin C and there's some controversy on how, when you have to give vitamin C to see that effect, but it is possible. Uh, vitamin C levels in sepsis patients are extremely low. And so what they're thinking is they're just rapidly replacing that vitamin C and inflammation is really high in sepsis. And sometimes that vitamin C tones down that inflammation. Not always. Um, vitamin C has also been piloted in COVID-19 patients. Uh, and so high dose is another way of just saying intravenous uh, doses of vitamin C. And um, it, it seems to be having some of the same effects as sepsis. It doesn't work in every patient. Uh, we don't exactly know why, when, why or when it works. Um, or if we're, we're just replacing vitamin C or we're doing something else that's on top of like um, necessarily neutralizing vi virus, we really have no idea. Um, but I, I like to say that, you know, you got to watch this area. This is some place where we could see some progress in vitamin C research. Right now, uh, the pilot trial in vitamin C, uh, the one mentioned below a couple few months ago, um, suggested that inflammation levels in these patients were down, but it didn't really cause uh, any of those patients to go off ventilators early. So some good effects, but not overwhelming success. And if you're interested in hearing more about intravenous vitamin C and some of the latest uh, vitamin C research, I suggest that you go to the Linus Pauling Institute's homepage and see our webinar, Vitamin C and Health New Frontiers, we just taped that about a month and a half ago. It was uh, me and four other vitamin C experts talking about, well, what's new and what's hot in vitamin C research. And, uh, you know, YouTube video is available for free. Uh, and so before I conclude today, I'd like to just talk about vitamin C supplements um, because that's the questions I get most often. Um, honestly, there's not much to say about vitamin C supplements at, except for it doesn't really matter what type of vitamin C supplements you take, as, assuming you're not having problems with the current vitamin C that you're taking. Um, a lot of people ask me about vitamin, uh, liposomal vitamin C. There's not a lot of good science about liposomal vi vitamin C, but it does suggest there's a little bit enhanced bioavailability for liposomal, but nowhere near the same uh, bioavailability as IV vitamin C. That's in a whole different ballpark. Um, how much vitamin C is considered too much? Well, I consider too much that uh, whatever makes your stomach upset. Um, tolerable upper intake levels or the ULs for vitamin C are set at 2000 milligrams a day because at that point, people start getting bloating, gas, diarrhea. Um, these are usually only temporary effects but I'm not necessarily advocating that someone just powers through and keeps taking high levels of vitamin C. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for high doses of vitamin C having any benefit versus lower doses like the 400 milligrams the Lyons Pauling Institute suggests. However, uh, when you're sick, uh, when, when you feel a virus coming on, some people suggest taking more and there's nothing wrong with you know taking more in the short term. Um, there is some suggestion that vitamin C has uh, there's a little risk for kidney stones um, with vitamin C. Um, I think that's kind of unclear at this point. Uh, people with high iron levels do have to worry about taking too much vitamin C, especially with iron sources, because if you've got iron overload, you don't want to add more iron to the problem. So separate out your vitamin C from your iron and you're probably fine. 
And with that, um, I'll just mention the uh, Linus Pauling Institute real quick. Um, we've been at Oregon State University now for 25 years. Um, we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. And this is our building, the Linus Pauling Science Center on the Corvallis campus, on the corner of Campus Way and 30th. And um, we love it. <laughs> <laughs> and with that i'll take any questions that you may have excellent alex hey thank you so much that was super super informative and it's funny you did such a good job in your presentation that as questions kept coming in like you nailed almost every single Boom. question that started coming in <laughs> so you did a really good job but we will um go through a couple just in case folks missed it through the presentation joined us late whatever else but um everyone thank you again for your your participation checking this out tonight um what i want to do real quick is we'll pull up the mentimeter slide again just as a reminder about what we're doing for audience participation for question and answer and a lot of you are putting stuff in already um for our event slide tonight uh, we are using event code 56681696. And again, that's 56681696 on your screen. You can go to minty.com or use your phones to pull the QR code up and pull the website directly up. And it'll go right to the Ask Alex a Question uh, section. So we've already had some people starting to ask some questions in here and they are still coming in. Um, like I said, Alex, a couple of these are going to be a little bit of repeat, maybe of what you've done, uh, but no just problem. in case folks have missed it. Um, let's see, you talked a little bit about kidneys, so I think we just hit on that the issue that um, really high levels of vitamin C could negatively impact the kidneys. You talked a little bit about the iron piece. Anything else you want to throw in there around kidney health and vitamin C? No, I think um, what we really don't understand with it when it comes to kidney stones is that we don't know why the kidney stones are being formed. Uh, you know, most of the time when someone gets kidney stones. And so whatever the, you know, vitamin C breaks down, when it breaks down, it breaks down into uh, a little carbohydrate called oxalate. And calcium oxalate stones are one of the types of kidney stones. Now, someone who eats a high oxalate diet doesn't necessarily get a kidney stone. Some people do, some people don't. So there's some physiological thing that's there that I can't really define because I'm not a nephrologist. Um, and I'm surprised I know what a kidney doctor actually is called. Uh, but, but uh, you know, that, that's happening. Maybe some oxidative stress in the kidney or some sort of poor filtration that's going on there. But some people have an, a problem. Some people don't. The data on, on vitamin C supplements and kidney stones is pretty weak. Um, and it suggests that you have to be taking vitamin C for a long period of time at doses of a thousand milligrams or higher. Um, but I've known people that have taken five grams of vitamin C a day for 30 years and then never had a problem. So you just got to weigh your personal risk on that one. Um, for iron, you know, that's people who with hemochromatosis have to be careful. It's iron overload. It's just a typical thing. What, what I didn't mention, I meant to put in there is that um, vitamin C actually aids with iron absorption. So if you do have anemia, that's an iron you know, deficiency, not other types of anemia, but the, the iron dependent anemia, that's a good way to boost your iron levels. If you take your vitamin C with your iron, hmm. uh, a lot of doctors actually don't know that one. I'm really surprised. That's one of the first things I learned about vitamin C is take it with iron, you get your iron levels back up. Well, that's, no, that's awesome. That's great. You see, I, I just, yeah, I think just we, we take for granted all the information that you guys have like poured your pat your, your, your lives and your passion <laughs> into around this. It's just, it's just awesome. Um, what about, I think you mentioned this a little bit around uh, injury. Uh, how does vitamin C function in wound repair? So maybe go into so, a little bit more detail with that. Yeah. So, um, Vitamin C is, it's kind of, it's unclear. I mean, vitamin C is important in collagen formation and collagen is important in knitting wounds together. Um, the, the person who actually turned Linus Pauling on to vitamin C initially, his, his name was Erwin Stone and he got into this horrible, horrible car wreck. And uh, the doctor said he was never going to walk again. He was going to have trouble breathing his entire life. You know, uh, lots of bones broken. I believe he broke all his ribs or something, you know, horrific like that. He attributed his recovery to high doses of vitamin C. Now, that may have worked for Erwin Stone. Um, 
other clinical trials haven't shown that that it aids repair uh, for everybody. Um, but you know, some there are trials that show you know that vitamin C during a surgery and after a surgery can actually help help healing a little bit. Uh, may reduce some pain that's associated with the surgery. Uh, it's, it's, but it's still kind of in that gray area, that nebulous. Um, I think you, you do have to be careful when it comes to wound healing, like especially with, say, cut on your skin. You don't want to put vitamin C on there because some oxidative stress is important in wound healing. Uh, you know, negating all oxidative stress is going to get you some improper uh, wound healing. Inside your body, though, your body regulates, you know, when the oxidative stress should happen, when the antioxidants should be coming in there, when the inflammation needs to be tamped down. So I wouldn't worry about it as much, but say, you know, I've, I've heard people say, oh, should I just put some vitamin C on my skin there? Don't mess with that. Okay. No, good tip. Good tip. Um, you talked a little bit about this too, as, as far as where the source of the vitamin C is coming from, but I don't know if you hit on this necessarily regarding like absorption rates. The difference between chewable tablets, food, or oral tablet, well, looks like an oral tablet tablet is a chewable tablet, but I think maybe they meant just like a swallow pill. The whole, yeah. chewable. The whole pill. <laughs> yeah. So is there is there a difference on absorption rates and is there, a, a, I guess, a, a desire to have one over the other? Short answer, we don't know. Yeah. Um, the, the, the longer answer is it doesn't seem to matter too much. Some people suggest that um, if your your tablets don't dissolve properly as they're going through your gastrointestinal tract, that that will cause a problem with absorption. Um, most likely, you're not absorbing all of a tablet anyway. Most vitamin C tablets nowadays are 500 milligrams or more. Um, my vitamin C uh, in the, my pan pantry is a thousand. Uh, milligrams. I couldn't get any lower. Um, and that's because vitamin C is pretty cheap. So they just throw more in there. Um, I, I typically just find it all like equivalent. Mostly I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, I think of the different formulations, like taking a chewable versus taking a tablet as being whatever is going to work for you to remember to take your vitamin C. The other thing that I should mention that I didn't really talk about too much was heartburn. A lot of people have told me I can't take vitamin C because it gives me bad, bad heartburn. And I understand you're taking a lot of acid. And especially if you're taking 1,000, 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C, thinking you're doing yourself some good, but your your stomach is really sensitive to that acid, it, you know, it might be very unpleasant for a while. So I would say take a buffered form of vitamin C. There's They're called buffered forms, even though they're not there's no buffer involved. Um, it's it's usually a mixture of mineral ascorbates. So calcium, magnesium, sodium ascorbate, those are all neutral. And so when you take one of those or mix it in some water, it'll, it won't be acid. Um, I do say consume it real quickly because, because it's not acid, it's not stable. But as soon as it gets into your stomach acid, it'll be fine. Um, liposomal vitamin C is another one that I think is gentler on people's stomach. Okay, great. Uh, another question is regarding, and I don't think you hit on this at all. Oh, I will say though, as a personal point, I was very excited about the whole bell pepper thing because <laughs> my thing would be never take a pill. I'm just going to eat a bell pepper a day. So I'll be golden. Um, <laughs> it's kind of um, funny. It's kind of funny that I'm a vitamin C researcher and I don't like bell peppers. That oh, much. oh no. I like, my heart hurts. I, I, I like chili peppers. I like, but bell peppers as a kid were the one thing my parents forced me to eat. And I just like disgusting. <laughs> I've, I've kind of gotten back into it just a little bit, but it has to be in the right application. So <laughs> yep, I, I understand. I understand. Let's see here. Uh, oh, okay. Here's a good one. Um, antioxidant supplements. So if you take an antioxidant supplement, so like a vitamin C pill, uh, it blocks your body's natural ability to produce antioxidants. And the, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, let me go back with this. I read okay. that it said that you take an antioxidant pill, it blocks your body's natural ability to produce antioxidants, and the pill version is useless. Is there any factor or fiction to this? Um, sort of. Uh, let's. Yeah, I I always exist in this kind of gray <laughs> nebulous area. Nebulous gray. Area. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I give you wishy-washy answers. That's how vitamin C works. Uh, research works. Um. 
there there is some concern that taking too much of antioxidants could I, I don't think it really diminishes your body's ability to produce antioxidants. What you're worried about is um, its effect on oxidation. And there's certain oxidant processes like wound healing that I was talking about that are very important in the body. Another ox, oxidation process uh, is, that we don't necessarily think about is exercise. When you exercise heavily, your body's producing a lot of oxidants and it's some of the response to those oxidants that we find beneficial, like building extra muscle or conditioning or, you know, um, so do you want to take a whole bunch of antioxidants to combat those oxidants? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you don't want it to run away. You don't want runaway oxidation where it's just going crazy and you're getting high levels of inflammation. But on the other hand, you want a little bit of oxidation to just so your body conditions itself. Um, I think there are some some studies that show that vitamin C, vitamin E supplements have been kind of iffy on on people that are doing high amounts of high intensity exercise. The the adaptation response is a little lower, but for most people, it's not really causing uh, much of a difference. Um, and and the body's very good at regulating its own vitamin C levels. The kidneys will get rid of anything extra you don't need, as long as you're not just jamming tons of vitamin C in there. I think if you were taking um, e even the amount of vitamin C that the Linus Pauling Institute recommends, you're probably not going to have any deleterious effects on the body's other antioxidants. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that response. Um, let's see, you talked a little bit about, well, I think the iron vitamin C uh, piece you talked about was mm -hmm. really, really fascinating. A couple other things as far as questions that have come in are regarding other relationships. Um, and I think probably this question is coming from a lot of the products that were created as vitamin C boosters and the powder packets you'd mix in with water. Uh, <laughs> does, ta does taking zinc with vi vitamin C work even better when sick? With the cold, I think you talked about like the properties of vitamin C before getting sick right. may reduce that time. Does zinc somehow elevate that relationship or what? any evidence out there around that? Well, I, I mean, I think zinc and vitamin C work together, but they don't necessarily work on the same thing. Zinc is an antioxidant mineral. Vitamin C is obviously a vitamin. Uh, they, they have some overlap in certain areas and the immune system being one of them. Um, and I think the, the evidence is that Zinc does some th beneficial things for the immune system. Vitamin C does some beneficial things for the immune system. The combination does not negate each other. And if anything, is is hopefully additive. I wouldn't necessarily call it synergistic because that makes it sound amazing. But, um, <laughs> but that multivitamin study that I mentioned actually contained uh, vitamin D, zinc, and vitamin C, along with a few other I think some B vitamins in there, but um, it, it was really the, the things that went up in the participants that were taking those vitamins were, or that combination was vitamin C and zinc. And they just so showed lower, lower cold symptoms and, uh, and lower severity of cold symptoms. And so I think, I think there's no harm in taking them together. Um, the only thing that I will mention is that that study from the Cleveland clinic, they were giving these poor patients eight grams of vitamin C a day. And the people who were getting zinc were getting 50 milligrams of vitamin C a day or 50 milligrams of zinc a day. And it, I don't know about you, but if I take a zinc supplement, my stomach hurts and 50 milligrams of zinc, it just sounds like a big gut ache. So <laughs> for me who can't really stomach uh, zinc supplements, I try to get my zinc from um, CalMag zinc supplements, which are usually better on my stomach or food sources. Excellent. Uh, no, actually another one related topic. Um, the iron absorption properties of vitamin C, can this actually help with osteoporosis as well? That's a little unclear. Um, we, I mean, the, um, the iron that's being absorbed is going into hemoglobin, most likely, um, heme, you know, it's, uh, I, I'm sure it's going in other places of the body, but it doesn't really have an effect on calcium. It doesn't seem to have an effect on magnesium. Um, some people, you know, there's probably some interplay with calcium and magnesium somewhere in the body with vitamin C, but we really don't understand it. Um, the more likely scenario 
is um, not besides iron vitamin C is probably regulating some of the copper status in the body because copper can react with vitamin C as well. Uh, but there's less evidence for that. So it's, it's more of the, you know, if you want to boost your iron levels for any reason, um, that's a good way to do it. I don't recommend it for any other mineral. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, another one looks like uh, using vitamin C in skincare products is the latest trend. Can you speak <laughs> to the effectiveness of this practice as far as improving the health and appearance of skin? And is this kind of related, I think, with the, the collagen effect? Like, yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. See, I learned something. Um, hey, I pay attention to. Yeah. All <laughs> this, this, you know, I, I usually, this is kind of the thing that I would sit here and say, that's totally bogus, but it's not. Uh, vitamin C serums, that's what they call them, um, actually turn out to be a good delivery mechanism for vitamin C on the skin. Uh, vitamin C is useful in the skin, not only in the dermis, which is the underlying levels of the skin. I'm doing my skincare model pose. Um, <laughs> Very but good the, outer, the outer levels, <laughs> the epidermis. And so, uh, the, so you get collagen, collagen and uh, antioxidant protection and collagen formation in the dermis, which gives uh, tone. Uh, but you also get uh, barrier function in the epidermis. And barrier function just means keeping water in. So you get moist, I guess you could use the word supple skin um, that's that's better able to meet the challenges that it faces. And um, now people who are using vitamin C in the skin do have to worry about sunlight. Uh, not that it's going to cause harm, but it will oxidize the vitamin C once you put it on your face. Uh, okay. It doesn't really get absorbed very quickly. Um, I actually have a whole uh, article on vitamin C and skin health in the Micronutrient Information Center. So if you want a, more information, um, go read that at, at the Lions Pauling Institute website. But I think it's actually not a bad thing for your skin. Um, we get we get exposed to so many harmful things, oxidants, sunlight, anything that can cause your skin to dry out. Um, putting some vitamin C on it actually might be a good thing. I, I haven't tried it yet myself, um, but I've seen the results in, in not only, you know, commercials, but uh, scientific studies. It works. Cool. Well, we just had a lot more questions come in and clearly we can't get to <laughs> everything tonight. So um, we will definitely put the, the email address up here a little bit, folks, when yes. we kind of close out the show, just as a reminder, and feel free to rewind the video back to it uh, in case you missed it, the show. But I think the reality is there's a lot of things, a lot of people having questions around um, different studies that have come out. And I mean, I think the thing is you can apply, does vitamin C do X, Y, Z for a lot of these? I mean, we've had questions around, uh, does alcohol degrade it? Uh, apparently they're trying to get vitamin c supplement during mixed drinks it, maybe we'll end with that one what's uh... mimosas <laughs> <laughs> orange juice uh <laughs> not screwdrivers not a problem actually <laughs> linus pauling loved vodka and uh, he called it vitamin v and so uh yeah i think a screwdriver makes perfect sense for for linus pauling <laughs> c and, and no problem go ahead Al add alcohol <laughs> and I'll to fantastic. Well, you can leave that as a, as, a, as an ending note. You can tell significant others, family members, partners, whoever. <laughs> hey, Alex told me to uh, have a mimosa. However uh, you get it is good. <laughs> however you get it is good. I like it. I like it. Well, Alex, thank you so much. Um, folks, again, thanks for joining us. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, tonight, what we'll do is, again, just a couple reminders that I wanted to put up before we close the show out uh, with a slide again of information to contact the folks at the uh, Linus Pong Institute. But a couple of event reminders, again, our science pubs, next four coming up, look for those registrations coming out in the very near future. Um, we also have the end slide, I believe we've got here, guys, of this is the how to ask more questions. So LPI at OregonState.edu. Check out the website. Um, I love the the all the information that you've got on it, kind of perusing around it. There's a lot of folks that have asked questions that we didn't get the answer tonight. The answers are on this website. So definitely check that out. Um, and one other thing for a final reminder that I want to shout out, we do not have a slide for tonight, but coming up um, at the end of April, folks may be aware of Damn Proud Day, which is a fantastic giving event that we have. This is a day of giving and connecting where um, all
all of our university supporters are looking at supporting specific university colleges, programs, initiatives, and empowering tomorrow's leaders and enabling OSU to continue advancing um, all the things that we're trying to do in education, research, scholarship uh, for our students and faculty. So uh, definitely put that on your dates, or on your calendar, uh, April 28th. There is an opportunity for you to give to specific projects. They have added things this year. As, uh, they did a, tic, a TikTok contest, um, a really neat film submission thing. Maybe you've got kids that are Beaver fans like mine, uh, that maybe they do something like that. There's a Beaver Athletics auction. Uh, there's a virtual photo booth. They are pulling out all stops this year to make this you know, the best damn proud day that we've had to this point. So definitely keep that in mind. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that at future science pubs. So let's see here. Last thing. Yeah, I think that's about it. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for attending this edition of OSU Science Pub. Um, massive thank you again to Alex for all his time and effort. Again, like I remind everybody, uh, they have full-time jobs outside of uh, sitting with me for an hour and a half and, and, and get, presenting on some fantastic information. So it does take some time to put these presentations together. And we, we definitely, definitely appreciate that. Uh, audience members, thanks for participating as usual. Had a good turnout again tonight. And as always, a special shout out to Connect Central Oregon for their production efforts. Um, so for tonight, this concludes our science book for Monday, April 12th. Uh, tell a friend about your experiences tonight. Shoot us topic ideas you'd like to see in the future. And again, we look forward to you joining us out there. So have a great night, everybody, and we'll see you soon.